open your Bibles and you're there at Acts chapter 6. Here's our full, our, our full life service. I'm excited. I think I'm, I, I love seeing all that God is putting together. So you can see up here, messenger or message. That's about the only slide that you're going to see until the closing slides. Message or messenger. Which one is more important, do you think? And I know that if I say that, I think personality is going to drive this a lot, or maybe your experience. But which one is more important? Is it more important that the person who's giving the message fits a certain type of profile and characteristic, or is the message more important? Is what we say more important than how we say it? And I keep thinking about that. And I think there are some of us that might say, you know, I, I know that it might be uncomfortable, but i rather have truth be told even if it comes out a little ugly. Or there are other people that say, no, it's far more important that we say things in a peaceable, respectable manner, even if it means we have to withhold the truth. And I've just been meditating on that thought because of our passage today. Which one does God choose? So not so much which one would you choose, but which one would God choose? If God had to give in on one or the other, where would he side? And I think our text is going to teach us a little bit about that today. See, we're in a transition point in the book of Acts, just so you know. We're kind of about to hit chapter 7, and it's going to be the longest message ever that you will find in the, in the book of Acts. You're going to see this huge, detailed uh, presentation, a sermon, and, and it's not given by an apostle. And this is why we're in a transition point, because God has used this leadership to initiate the birth of the church. There's 25,000 mas o menos, menos que mas, believers in this city, and now God goes from introducing to us deacons like we saw last week, and then God's going to highlight for us two of those deacons. And it's going to be Stephen and a guy named Philip. And this is why many commentators go, this is a transition point. There's going to be another transition point where you're going to have a, an amazing turnaround, a conversion story, and all of a sudden... You're going to hear about Peter for a little bit and about some of the early problems within the church when it comes to prejudice issues. God said you're going to give the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Samaritans and then out to the Gentile world. And some of the people who were Jewish didn't want to share it with Samaritans. And you're going to see that God has a word for us there. But here's a transition from people who we would look at and say, man, these are like elite leaders, the most educated of the educated or the most influential, whatever. You're kind of seeing that and all of a sudden there's two kind of normal guys that get highlighted for us. And we have now Stephen. So how will God move his ministry forward? What will that look like? What are some of its elements? There's great persecution going on. We noticed throughout our journey that there's been a persecution that at first was like hey you better be quiet to know if you're not quiet we will punish you to then physical punishment and now we're going to see where persecution ultimately comes to a place of actually getting people arresting them but the man we will look at today will be murdered for his stance and so we have this guy named Stephen let's read about him now Acts chapter 6, and we're going to begin in, chap in chapter 6, verse 8 through 15, and then I'm going to jump just because I want you to look at the two bookends of his life to the end of his life in chapter 7. So let's begin. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Sicilia and Asia, they rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And when they set up 
Uh, and they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So that's the kind of introduction to Stephen. Now let's go to the end of his life. Would you go to chapter 7? And we're going to look at verses 54 through 60. I'm not preaching 54 through 60 today, but I just want you to see who this man is. Verse 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man, a young man named Saul, and as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Let's pray together for the ministry of the word and for our dear sister Eunice. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your care for us. Lord, I thank you, Lord, even this morning as the music was prepared and how things have come together and the reading of your word. God, all of it is being orchestrated, Lord, to grow us and to shape us into the image of Christ. And Lord, I want to acknowledge, Lord, that I am so thrilled to be going on this journey in the book of Acts because I want to grow, God, in my witness. I want to grow, God, in how I reflect who Jesus is to the world and i pray god that you would bring clarity to our lives on not only the message of the gospel and what we should be saying but also on how we should be saying it and i pray father that you would do a great work in this church and then i must acknowledge god that even though my aim today is very specific as we look at the life of stephen you are a marvelous god that is always up to greater things than we could ever imagine. And so in this room right now, you will speak into people's hearts and lives. Maybe someone needs encouragement. Maybe someone needs God to, to be nudged to deal with God their sin. Maybe someone here has been very flat, God, spiritually. They have not sensed in their life a sense of purpose and enthusiasm about God. Their, their walk with you. And I pray, God, that now that you would, in your most amazing way, speak to lives. May hearts be open. May people be willing to listen and hear and respond. And so, God, do your work. And God, there's many things that we can pray for. We've been praying for our country. I think we've been praying also, God, as Christians, how do we respond? What are ways that we can communicate and speak? But I think you're teaching us a lot of that. But God, as I now intercede for many things, I pray specifically for Eunice. God, I pray as she's far from home with no um, physical family around, this is, can be a very scary and difficult moment. I pray, God, that you would protect her, that you would bring the right doctors around, the right people. And I know, God, that as you're protecting her and taking care of her, because you can be everywhere and anywhere and do anything, may you use this moment, God, to not only draw Eunice to yourself, but also that she would be able to bring others to you. And so, God, encourage her. Take care of her in a special way. And we thank you, God, for your sovereignty, your providence, and your timing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What an amazing story we just read in this passage. Here you see a man in the very beginning speaking and performing and doing things in a certain way that were pretty amazing. But to be quite honest with you, to see the end of his life is even more amazing, right? 
to see a man, and you're saying, what happened between chapter 6 and at the ending of 7, right? You're like, what would cause people to grind their teeth, all right? What would cause people to just become enraged? I am not going to do it because I think someone's going to like clip me and meme me, and so I'm not going to do it. But just imagine, right? Plugging your ears, grinding your teeth, and la 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 la, whatever that would look like, all right? Lucas, can you come forward and do that for me? I'm joking, all right. But it would look quite childish, would it not, right? To plug your ears, to be enraged, to grind your teeth, it just looks quite childish. But this is how people responded to whatever Stephen's message um, was communicated. And so, as I think about this question, message or messenger, which one is important? See, the early church, one of the things that we will learn as we walk through this, the early church shined in marvelous ways. And they, don't, they didn't, did not only shine because of the message that they had, redemption, that Jesus had come and had accomplished so many things, but they were effective too because of how they communicated. I'm not going to do it today, but I can give you historical evidence from many, many people who speak of the early church and are absolutely blown away at their character. It almost infuriated some Roman um, authorities when they said, ah, oh, they not only take care of their own, but ours as well. This was why the Christian movement was, was was, you know, having such an impact in that early society and culture. And here we have, I think, for us, a small shooting star. That's the only way I can think of uh, to describe Stephen. He comes on the scene and he exits so quickly. But he sure is bright. And he sure is someone for us to look at. Message or messenger. And so what Stephen is going to teach us today is that we're going to be able to take a look and I hope be able to make some conclusions about what our answer should be when it comes to messenger or message. Now, I really can't get into all the details of the message because the message, though we do get a glimpse of it in chapter 6 of what his content is, the real meat and potatoes of what he shares is almost all of chapter 7. There's 53 verses of what Stephen preaches to this assembly of people that causes them to plug their ears and grind their teeth. And it is a very detailed message and one that I hope to tackle next week. And so our focus today is on the messenger. And so our first point is, the marks of this man. The marks of this man. What are some things that distinguish or stand out to you about Stephen? Well, the text shows us a, very, a few things, but one of them is that he had remarkable skill in sharing the gospel. He had a skill in his communication that really stands out. His opponent said in verse 10, they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. And so there's two things marked out for us in verse 10, this concept of wisdom and of this spirit, right? And the word spirit here is interesting. In many of yours, right, is it a capital S, right? It's because it, there's, some, there's actually two contexts going on. There is a spirit that he's filled in, but there's also like the way that he is doing it as well. And so he's full of wisdom. He has this reasoning ability, this way of communicating something and wait till you Go into chapter 7 and see how he communicates. This massive Old Testament takes everyone on a journey very clearly, giving us what has happened in the Old Testament. But it's also the spirit, a spirit of confidence, of boldness, of even power. He just communicated it in such powerful ways. He has a firm handle on the gospel message and its content. And you're going to really see that next week. But you can even just get a glimpse of it here in verse 13. This fellow never stops speaking against the law. Okay? He never stops speaking against the law. 
This shows that he was proclaiming that we are saved by grace and not by keeping the law. And so there's just something about Stephen and how he communicates that arrest your attention and has boldness and firmness, but it's also winsome and wise. You know, we've had a believer, a great Christian among us who has recently gone to be with the Lord. And I don't know how familiar you are with this man. I know that I have watched, I would say, close to a hundred hours of his content over my life. But someone that makes me think of someone who is full of wisdom and the Spirit, and whereas we're going to see in a little bit, and grace and power and authority, and it almost just defies logic of like, how can he be so steadfast, truthful, yet so gracious and gentle? How does he do both? And it's, it's the Christian man, Ravi Zacharias. If you ever watch the man, he doesn't pull punches or give in or, or run scared. He knows what he believes and he says it. And people counter him and he's gentle and, and he's a happy warrior in a sense. And I've actually seen it displayed, and I would say that Stephen, in many ways, right, I think kind of can be brought to flesh as I think of Ravi Zacharias. But this, there is a balance here. One of the marks of this man is that there is a balance that should not be here. There is something happening that should not be brought together. And this is this concept of grace and power. And you saw that in verse 8. What do you mean by that, Chago? See, if somebody is gracious, if you and I were to describe somebody as gracious, we might not think of him as powerful, right? As firm. But here, he's described as someone who is gracious. He's compassionate, sensitive, peaceful. But he's also powerful, doing great signs and wonders. He's doing things that catch people's attention. He's bold, forthright, so how do these things come together in this man? How do these marks that we see in Stephen all kind of fit together? And I got to tell you, I go back not only to what we found out last week, that when they chose Stephen in the first place, was that what? He was full of the Spirit. And we already read in chapter 7 at the end, we are reminded again you can go and read it for yourself, that he was full of the Spirit. See, Stephen was a man that was dominated and controlled by the Spirit. That is why you can blend these things like grace and power and wisdom and gentleness and firmness. How does this all come together? Because he's a man full of the Spirit. He is a mature man. Uh, I didn't bring up this last week, but I should have. You know, they were looking around for people that were going to be the first deacons. And you have 25,000 people that have come to know Jesus in a very short period of time. Like, how do you even assess that? How, how does anyone stand out from among the crowd, basically? And Stephen was so unique and so full of God's spirit that he stood out to be selected, named as the first. And of course, he's the, the one that we get to get a, a, a personal view of his life. See, Jesus had said that this is one of the most key and important things in your life, is that you would be full of the Spirit. I'm gonna just read two passages for you just so that you can be reminded of something. But why was he winsome? Why was he able to say firm things? Why was he able to have power? Why was he able to do this? Because he was a man who was controlled and dominated and submitting to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said this in Luke 12, 11 and 12. When they bring you before the synagogues, and he is before the synagogues, and the rulers and the authorities do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense, or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Stephen is testament to that. Luke 21, 14. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. 
For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. He promised that he would let the Holy Spirit so overtake them that even the things they communicated could not be resisted or refuted. And they could not. And we will find out that they had no other alternative than just to kill him because there was no room to have an argument or a discussion or a debate. What amazing marks we see in the life of Stephen. And I want you to know that I think the main reason he was used by God is because he was a man full of the Spirit. And so just in a practical way before we take a look at some of the content of his message, are you a Spirit-filled person? Is your life marked by wisdom, by steadfastness? I don't know about you, but at times I feel actually more controlled by my emotions. Um, one of the reasons that I have been a little more cautious to be saying a whole lot about what's going on in society because I, I don't trust my emotions, number one. And number two, I want to make sure that I'm filled with the Spirit. Because if it's filled with the Spirit, then I know that God can use it for many beautiful and wonderful things. But too often we're filled with, like I mentioned last week, often opinion, right? Or a reaction. I want to be filled by the Spirit. I want to be able to be falsely accused. I want people to be riled up around me and me respond like Stephen responded. To be a faithful messenger of the message. We need to be full of the Spirit. Number two, let's take a quick overview of the content of his message because we're going to get into the weeds next week about that. But we know early on that one of the things that he was bringing forth is that he was declaring that their reliance on a system had failed. Not that the system had failed. Jesus had designed this whole thing, right? This is a system that that brings you an understanding of the holiness of God that is for your flourishing. And I've taught that before when we were going through the book of Hebrews and Galatians. But their reliance on this system had failed. The charge against Stephen was that he was preaching that Jesus made the temple obsolete and that Jesus also made the law of Mo Moses obsolete. Clearly, this was absolutely alarming to this group. And I want us to know, and I can't take you there, but basically what's taking place here is that the things that Jesus had began to teach in his life that caused him to get murdered, that caused people to be riled up against him, basically Stephen is continuing the same points as, as Christ. The accusations are the same for Jesus as they are of Stephen. The temple and the law. Now, Jesus most definitely taught that he, he made both the temple and the law obsolete. He claimed to replace the temple, John 2, 18 and 19. And this was one of the accusations that led to his execution because we know in Mark 14, 58, it specifically says, this is why uh, we are putting you to death because you said you would tear down the temple. And when he died, God ripped the veil in the temple to show that Jesus was right. In Mark 15, 38. Now, I can't get into the details of this, but basically Jesus is going to replace the purpose of the temple. He is the temple. And I'm not going to get into all the details. There's so many wonderful uh, passages. He is the mercy seat. He is all of these things. But when the temple is destroyed, we have a new temple and a new priest, and a new sacrifice, and a new access to glory and fellowship with God. So when John the Apostle has a vision of heaven in Revelations 21, the temple has been so done away with that in Revelations 21, 22, and 23, he says, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city had no need of a sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light. And its lamp is the Lamb. What Jesus meant when he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, was that he himself was taking the place of the temple by dying for our sins once and for all, by rising from the dead to reign as the everlasting priest and Lord of glory. So when I die, the temple system dies, Jesus said. 
I am the priest and the go-between, uh, go-between with God. I am the presence and the radiance of his glory. The temple is finished. Guess who continued that same message? Stephen did. Stephen did. And he also, they accused him of saying that the Mosaic ceremonial laws were obsolete in him. And so he just said some of the similar things that Jesus had said, and it caused quite a response. Now, I want to know something for you that many commentators noted, and I I think it's important. There's actually kind of a difference between Peter and Stephen. If we've been taking a look at Peter's different different sermons, right, we've seen him have sermons where we get like, I would say, a more condensed version of what he said. But in Peter's preaching of the gospel up till now, this theme of works versus faith has kind of been a little muted or in the background. When you look at what Peter is teaching, he's basically mainly talking about the fact that a sovereign God has made this plan and you have rejected that plan. And Peter has said some very bold things. The main one that I think is, you murdered Jesus. You killed him. But now Stephen is highlighting this contrast between works versus faith. And it's right in the forefront. Stephen, uh, uh, Stephen evidently pressed home that Jesus is our temple and Jesus is our cleanness before God, that Jesus has fulfilled the law, so we are now saved through his law keeping, Jesus' law keeping. His righteousness beca- becomes mine. His performance becomes mine. And so this is what Stott says, John Stott. What Jesus taught then was that the temple and the law would be superseded that they would find their God-intended fulfillment in him, in Christ. Jesus was the replacement of the temple and and the ultimate fulfillment of the law. And for this, Stephen faces oppression. And that leads us to our third point. Let's look at the opposition for a little bit. Because I think one of the best ways to ever highlight things in life is to look at the opposite or to look at the contrast. And so here we see this man full of grace and wisdom, full of the Spirit. And now let's take a look at the opposition. God has so ordained that the church from the very beginning, that death is the way to life and the cross the way to victory. And you see it even here now. And you see some terrible opposition. And I actually wrote it down here. This is from an old theologian, dead dude. It says, a new battle for the church has begun. There's a battle on here. It's a battle not against flesh and blood. It's a battle against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And it's a reminder to us that you and I live in a world where the devil is exercising his hostility and enmity against all that is Christ. Because I was a little bit taken aback by really just slowing down and reading through the text what this opposition is described uh, as through their actions. And so I call it satanic fruit because the end result of what this opposition is, right? These, I'm not gonna get into details. You say, what are these weird names? Cyrenians and freedmen. They're they're just Jewish people who were scattered before and the freedmen were people that were in, they were at one time under slavery, under Roman rule, and they were made free, declared free. So they're kind of declared freedmen in the Roman world, but they're of Jewish descent. And there's different, um, you know how we have denominations in our church, there are a lot of little churches everywhere? Well, think of, of, of the Jewish world that way as well. And when you hear like synagogue, you might be thinking of it um, as like, I know I used to think about it like this years ago, but a synagogue is because they don't have a temple. And so if I lived in Athens and I was a Jewish person and I wanted to worship in a Jewish way, then I would go to a local synagogue. That is true, but that's only half of it because there's even particular synagogues that are connected to certain rabbinical teachings. Does that make sense? And so kind of denominational in some ways. And so what you have here. Uh, One historian said that there was noted within the city of Jerusalem 239 synagogues. And obviously one of the synagogues that was there 
was where people that were of more Hellenistic background, and we learned that last week, these were kind of people who were very Romanized. This was kind of their synagogue. And so this is where uh, Stephen is basically interacting with these people. He's interacting with these people, and they're the ones that respond in such a vehement way. And so let's take a look at the opposition, this satanic fruit. Number one, there was a scheme. These are godly people, okay, religious people, all right? There was a scheme to lie. I mean, you gathered someone together and said, we need you to lie, all right? We need you to not tell the truth. So this is what the opposition did against Stephen. There was a scheming. I think that's important to note. There was this, this kind of getting together, and you're going to find out that very, like, serious, you know, high-level Jewish people, maybe the real faithful ones, who, ones who weren't Hellenists, are now kind of scheming with the Hellenists, and there's this scheming to come together to, to deal with Stephen. There's also a smearing going on. We need to lessen his character. We need to have people question what Test, test. I have the handheld. Do you want me to go to the handheld, Josh? Yeah, no, no, I'm going to go over here. One, I, got the, I got this. Five, four, three, two, one. Tests. Thank you. And so you have not only them lying, scheming, but then you have smearing. And then you see a lawless mob. The members of the Sanhedrin lost all self-control, all dignity, and in their rage became this ungoverned group. And one of the things that was very, very fascinating about this is that one historian said, in a Roman culture, if you were ever caught lying in a, a formal setting, it would be your death. In a Roman culture, if you incited a mob... It meant death. And it just shows you in a, a sense, when you contrast Stephen and this, this opposition, is how unhinged they are. It might cost us our life, right, to incite this, this riot. But it's worth it to get at Stephen, to get at these Christians who are having an impact. So what, what is going on? The opposition is reacting in such a, a unsettling way. Why? And you know why? Number one, I think religious people are often the most hardened in their opposition to the gospel. Religious people are often the most hardened in their opposition to the gospel. You might think that drug addicts are or, or really, really, you know, sinful, lawless people. But you notice that these religious people, by their reaction, are having a really hard time with what's taking place. Why? Why are they having such a hard time? Because I believe that their I entire identity structure, what they rely on, what they have put their hope in, what makes them better than you, what makes them sleep at night knowing I'm a good person, is being threatened. You mean my reliance on the system? My reliance on the law keeping? My reliance on this temple? All, my reliance as God's favored child doesn't get me anywhere with God? How devastating. And I want you to know that we as Christians can struggle with the very same thing. Guys, I, I, to think that somehow legalism or, or putting our hope in our own self-righteousness is just something that happens to, to some people in the, in the Bible is very misguided. We are so susceptible of the same thing. We are susceptible to know a lot of the Bible 
or to have certain practices in our life, and what starts to creep into your heart is that that is what makes you a good person. My attendance at church, my faithfulness here, my understanding of these things, that makes me a good person. And Stephen is threatening that. And I think one way or a mark, guys, of how you can know if your identity is misplaced in your performance rather than Christ is look at your response. Just look at your response. You learn so much more about who you are, about how you respond, more than by what you say about yourself, just so you know. If you, you, I can tell you all day who I think Chago is. What does that matter? Watch how I respond. That is far more important to tell you about who I am deep inside. And these religious people are being threatened at the very core of their identity. And we can be as well. Are you, are you tempted to lie, to smear, to, to just kind of categorize a certain group of people this way because they don't see eye to eye with you? Look out for your reactions. What is your identity based upon? And so that leads me to my final point here. Stephen's character and countenance. Stephen's character and countenance. We kind of saw some of the marks of his life. We looked at the content of, his, of what he was teaching. We looked at the opposition. But the passage ends with what? The group being in shock at who Stephen is. He had the face, the face of an angel. So, I want to just kind of say, first of all, many people have said that Stephen seems to be described as supremely Christ-like. And I think when I, two weeks from now, when we preach about his death, look how many Christ-like, Christ-like responses that Stephen is having. Praying for his enemies, full of grace, full of wisdom, cannot be refuted against, right? Commending his spirit to God. I mean, there's so many things happening in Stephen's life that make you think of Jesus. And it's interesting to note that Stephen's face shone radiantly in verse 15. Now you say, what is that about, Chago? I think Luke, and nobody knows, nobody can know this for sure because there's no text that tells you that this is what's happening, but I think Luke wants to point or highlight for you something. Who else in the Bible is ever described as having a face that shines like that of an angel? And it's Moses, of course. When he came down from the mountain carrying the tablets of stone on which was the law. And far from disrespecting the law, Luke is saying, what we have here is another Moses, in a sense, who is in fact interpreting Moses correctly and actually not just putting the law away, but enhancing the law and seeing how Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of that law. And I think Luke wants us to appreciate that part of the explanation. The godliness of Stephen, his face shined like that of an angel, his countenance really, really stuck out. You know, I want you to do this for me. I want you, want you to just see something in the scriptures that's really encouraging. Would you open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3? And I know you're like, man, child, I didn't know you were going to go here. I don't want to be here too long. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it's a really great text where you get to begin to understand what, what God was doing to a veiled people who could not see, who did not understand what Christ was up to. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, it says, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, what Moses did that lit up his face when he came down from the mount, if that was glorious, um, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Whatever he experienced, that glory has kind of been done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Now, look at verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation 
be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which, which remains is glorious. Now, I'm not going to unpack all of that for us today, okay? I'm not going to un- unpack all of that, but just think about that. We do at least have scripture. I can't tell you that his face represents Moses. I can't do that. But I can tell you that whatever Moses experienced in the past that made his face shine and in small way to reflect the glory of God is a lesser glory than the glory that Stephen is experiencing. That I can tell you word for word the Bible says. It is a greater glory. And so as you look at his face, at his countenance, at his response, it is a glorious thing. And if you're like me over the years when I've read the story of Stephen, when I read the end of his life, I'm always sobered and in awe. Who would do that? Who could have people gnashing their teeth? Who could be acting crazy, a riot, drug out into the street. You, you, you grab me right now and drag me a half a mile? I would not be happy with you. But this guy asked God to forgive them. It's an ama- it's, it is so surreal. It is over the top. And all I can tell you is that if you thought what Moses experienced was glorious... What Stephen is doing is even more glorious. And it's meant to be that way. Because it's meant to continue to drive us and move us forward to the ultimate glory, which is in Christ. And so this aspect about Stephen is what I call humble boldness. A humble boldness. And I'll end with this. Stephen has the spirit and he's full of it. And in many ways... He looks a little bit like Jesus, a lion lamb, right? A willingness to tell you bold things that could cause great conflict, but just do it in such an amazing, gentle, and profound way, almost to the point where you say, man, this guy is so amazing. So what is it? Only the gospel can produce this type of humble boldness. What's my answer to, Chago? Is it message or messenger? It's both. Don't let anybody, and I know you can listen to some pundits on TV and tell you, no, 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 the message is more important than the messenger. Don't, it's not. It's got to have both. You must speak the truth in love. You have to. I'll never forget when God awakened me. It was in a premarital counseling session with somebody. We were walking through 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm working through that to get a definition of love, and it just hit me. It doesn't matter what you would ever do, how eloquent you would ever be, how powerful you would ever. Your argument could be amazing, but if there is no love in it, the Bible says it's a big zero with the line erased. It's empty, nothing, vain. Think about that. And so you might be tempted to say, no, the message is more important than the messenger, and it's both. The way you say that message is just as critically important as the message itself. And this is what we see in the life of Stephen, this humble boldness. And where does he get it? He gets it from the gospel. See, the gospel tells us that we are helpless sinners. And it's going to create a humility that does not go away. But we are completely accepted in Christ, creating a boldness that doesn't go away either. And so it can produce in you and me, the gospel can produce grace and power. When the gospel comes home, it's humbling and affirming. It turns every believer into a bold, humble witness. See, and this is one of the ways that I know when I begin to kind of lean towards my performance. If I think that my standing before God is based on what I do and how, and how I do it and, and my ability and my skill, my performance, whether we like it or not, it makes me arrogant. It does, right? 
It makes you arrogant. You cannot help it. If your identity is based on performance, you will be arrogant. But if it's not based on your performance and your right standing before God is completely based on his performance, it will make you humble. That's just the way it works. And don't think as a Christian that you're like, well, I was saved one day and my performance is gone. No, no, you're going to struggle with this. Everybody, right, is a struggling legalist, just so you know. All of us. But this affirmation of the gospel is going to make you have this amazing boldness. So let me read this quote. The gospel makes us neither self-confident nor self-disdaining, but both bold and humble. To the degree I am still functionally earning my word through performance, to the degree I'm still functioning in this works righteousness, to that degree I will be either operating out of superiority or inferiority. You say, well, why inferior? Because if I don't meet the standard, I'm going to feel like a loser. And that can sometimes be mis construed as humility i'm a nobody i shouldn't serve the church i shouldn't no that's just a, a wrong perspective because if i'm saved by my works then i can either be confident but not humble or humble but not confident but with the gospel i will not be forced to be superior or inferior to swing back and forth i won't the gospel humbles me before anyone, telling me I am a sinner saved only by grace. But it also emboldens me before anyone, telling me I am loved and honored by the only set of eyes in the entire universe that really matter. So the gospel gives a boldness and a humility that does not, that does not go against each other, but increase more and more in bold humility. Messenger or message? Both both and we're going to take a look at the message next week and it is a powerful thing a powerful thing but i know that one of the things that maybe why i've been feeling so much unrest is i'm just going to tell you okay side note should i move away from the pulpit i am my opinion this whole um conflict within our society and culture about race and prejudice if you, don't, if you want to dismiss it and go, it's, no, it's not there, we're going to find out. This is why I just love going expositorily through the Bible. Why? Because he's the best shepherd in the world. And we're about to, whether we like it or not as a church, we're going to deal with prejudice and partiality in Acts chapter 10 and 11. The early church had the very similar problems, uh, problems of preferring other people or maybe not serving people a certain way. The early church had that problem. And we, through the Holy Spirit, are going to get to address some of those things. And so, yeah, there's, there's people who are prejudiced in every society. Why? Because it's a mark of sin. <laughs> it doesn't matter what culture you're from, uh, we have missionary friends who, who have worked uh, in Africa. And one of the things that they said that, that st stood out to them, and they're black people, and they worked in Africa, and they said, you know, we just thought, oh, we're, we're in Africa, and we'll never face anything. And very quickly, you would get what's called the accent price on something and the non-accent price on something. And they could tell, oh, you're not from here. So because you're not from here, you get charged this. You don't get invited. It's just a product of sin. It's just a product of sin. But here's the other reason why it's been hard for me sometimes to respond. Because social media is, we're talking about one of the biggest topics in our culture. And you think you're going to clear it up with five sentences? you got to be crazy. Like, it needs books and chapters and dialogue and conversation. And that's why I'm uncomfortable to, like I said, could I ever sufficiently respond to this in a Christ-honoring way in two sentences? Probably not. 
right? It's too complex. It, it would diminish uh, or be inappropriate, I feel. And so that explains to you maybe some of the hesitancy. And then the other part too, a, a dear brother of mine sent something to me and it, it kind of made me chuckle and laugh. But it, it, it made me understand why we have a sense of paralysis as a people, as Christian people. Because one moment is say something. The next moment is you have no right to say anything. One moment is say this. No, you can't. And it's just like, where, where do we land? How do you respond? And it just feels in, in a sense like, am I just trying to respond in, in a very quick way to a piece, uh, a friend, or to make a political statement? No. I want to respond God's way. And that's where God has taken me in my heart. I want to respond God's way with his spirit. And this is why I've just been diving into the word more and more and more. It's making me feel like I need to do that more and more. And I'm thankful for that. And so, why? Because I think the message, if I'm going to proclaim that Jesus is the only way, then I've got to make sure that the way I say it reflects that message. The messenger and the message are critically important. And we see that throughout the, the, the word of God, and we see that in the life of Stephen. So I think at this time, is there a closing song, one? You have a closing song? Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. We're going to read our great commission together. And then, Juan, maybe you can bring your team up while I'm reading that, right? That'd be great. And then at the end, Tara will come and give a few announcements to us. Let's read this together. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority... I'm sorry, we're all reading it together. Ready? And Jesus came and said to them, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Why doesn't somebody say something? It looks good on my screen. That's wonderful. It's coming, it's coming. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Lord. There we go, here we go. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. So my declaration to you as it has been before they sing is the same. Now go and be what you are. Be the church. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and 